Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, I have, my name is Don Elliman, and I have the honor of being the Chancellor of the University of Colorado uh, Anschutz Medical Campus, and we're delighted to have you with us today. This is our second panel on COVID-19, and in this session, our intention is to give you a sense of how we're dealing with the pandemic and, and what we, where we see the care environment headed. Um, before we begin, uh, let me express my gratitude to everybody in the audience today um, and the strong community of support that you've shown us. We've uh, received uh, over $2.4 million in direct support for the caregivers here on this campus. Uh, and, that, and much of that money comes from folks uh, watching this show today. So we're really, really grateful for that support. You know, we, we hear the expression again and again that we're all in this together. And it, it, it almost gets to the point where it seems like it's trite, but it's not. It's true. And the evidence of that is in the audience today. So thank you very much for being here. Um, you will note that we are being socially responsible. Uh, we all came here with our masks, uh, but uh, it's kind of tough to talk through the cotton. So we, we have a six foot cone of, of, mm -hmm. uh, of distance or, or more between us. And we would urge you to respect that, that same policy that the Centers for Disease Control and the state has mandated. But let me now get, get right to the panel. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions of these folks that have joined me today. Uh, we hope at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, uh, discussion that we'll have some time for questions from you. So if, if you have questions and submit them to the chat room, we'd be, uh, we'd be happy to try to fit as many in as we can. Um, those at the front lines are obviously the, the true heroes of this story. And I'm very fortunate to have four of my colleagues here with me today. Uh, first is Dr. Richard Zane. Uh, Rich is the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And he's also the chair of the emergency department or the head of the emergency department at University Hospital. Rich is also the chief innovation officer at UC Health and the skills that he brings to that, uh, that task have served him well in the last uh, eight weeks. Next is Dr. Gene Kuttner. Uh, Gene is the Chief Medical Officer of UC Health and University Hospital and a Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Gene has directed much of the development and coordination of the clinical response to the pandemic. After that, we have Dr. Thomas Campbell, who's a Professor of Infectious Diseases at the University of Colorado. Tom is one of the leaders in clinical trial activity in finding potential therapies for this disease. Last and far from least is Kathleen Coombs. Kathleen is an ICU nurse at University of Colorado Hospital. She's been doing that, I'm told, for 17 years. Although looking at her, I can hardly believe that. <laughs> she is at the very front of the front line. Uh, I'm gonna start with Dr. Zane. Uh, Rich, you see the patients first. What are you usually dealing with when they present in, to the emergency department? It's, it's really difficult to describe uh, what it's like. So I would ask you to sort of picture an environment that is fundamentally different than it's ever been before. Uh, something that people may not know is that uh, emergency department and urgent care volumes have been uh, pretty low since this started, I think, because people are afraid to come to the emergency department or afraid to overwhelm us. Uh, so we see patients who present with all manner of complaints. And for patients who we suspect um, may be presenting with a complication of COVID-19, um, they present across the spectrum uh, from patients who are having chest pain or a headache or a stroke that may be a mimic due to COVID-19 from the, the symptoms or the syndrome that you've been reading about and seeing, which is a profound and very peculiar respiratory distress. Uh, what we've learned is that this is almost an entirely new disease uh, with pathophysiology that is contrary to anything we have learned. So what I know now about how to treat a patient with COVID-19 is fundamentally different than it was six or, or eight weeks ago. But what we see is someone who has complaints of an upper respiratory infection, uh, which could include and usually does some type of fever or cough um, and shortness of breath. And then patients are in a very peculiar way, uh, more calm than you would expect when someone is so profoundly ill. So we'll see patients with oxygen levels that are 50, 60, or 70% when normal is higher than 95. And although they're a little bit short of breath, they 
with any other disease would be incredibly short of breath and almost in extremis. And then we go step by step by step on how to treat them. And the only tools in our toolbox for treating them are really supportive care, uh, supplemental oxygen, uh, electrolytes if they need it, and then some patients, many patients stay in the hospital. So it's a real surreal environment. Um, it's unlike anything anybody has ever seen before. Uh, people are dressed completely head to toe in protective equipment as we see these patients, and they are profoundly ill or can be profoundly ill. Uh, uh, Dr. Cutner, Jean, um, uh, obviously a, a substantial percentage of these people end up getting admitted onto the floors. Um, you were involved or directed really the, the building of the infrastructure to take care of this, this surge. What, what was involved in that? And, I mean, it, it, it was writing a whole new playbook, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, as Rich said, it's really like nothing we've seen before. And I think this is really uh, kudos to um, us being an academic medical campus is our teams actually started planning before we even saw our first patient uh, here. And this was this tremendous collaboration between our, pulmon our pulmonary division, our hospital medicine division, surgery department, anesthesia department, to create a one, two, three, four stage surge plan for how to best treat these patients so that we had the services within the hospital to be able to address the, the needs of them, both for those patients that get admitted to the hospital floor as those as about a third uh, of the patients that get admitted to the hospital end up in the intensive care units, and I'm sure Kathleen will talk about that. And then that collaboration across with nursing, respiratory therapy, pharmacy, all those components to make sure that we're keeping our frontline providers safe in caring for these patients, as well as meeting the patient's needs. One of the rapid things that, we, that we've been doing all along, um, Rich said we go step by step, we've put into place evidence-based algorithms for treating these patients on the outpatient side, because our outpatient-based docs are also here, and advanced practice providers are also you know, getting a lot of calls or seeing patients often virtually. What are those step-by-step -step steps to take care of those patients? And then on the inpatient side as well, and we've been regularly updating those because we have them integrated within our electronic medical record so that we can regularly update them. As Rich said, we're, we are learning day by day new evidence in terms of how to treat these patients. And we've, we've seen it bear out. We've seen actually our um, outcomes improve month to month as we've gotten new evidence and actually gotten better at it. That's great. Dr. Campbell, you're at the front line of that same care team. Do you have anything to add to, to Dr. Kuttner's comments about that? I mean, it, it's been an amazing experience for those of you that are, are actually uh, in the, in, at the bedside every day. It has been, and I agree completely with uh, what Dr. Kuttner and Dr. Zane have said. It's really been a learning experience as we've uh, gone along, and, uh, and things have improved uh, in our ability to uh, take uh, care of these patients who are very sick. Uh, as Dr. Zane said, our toolbox is very limited. We don't have much in the way of, uh, of tools, and, uh, and research uh, has been very important to try to uh, develop some tools that uh, we might be able to use in the care of these patients. So you're, uh, you're one of the main keepers of the toolbox uh, in clinical trials. You direct, you're the PI for, for at least one that I know of, maybe more. Um, can you talk to us about the clinical trial experience that's going on right now? Yeah, so um, uh, as you know, this, uh, this disease and this uh, illness came upon us very, very quickly. And uh, just, you know, over the, it's only been four months since um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus was discovered. And we know two uh, fundamental things about uh, this illness. Number one is that it's caused by a virus. And number two, that when people present to the emergency room or get admitted to the hospital, they often have a very intense inflammatory process that seems to not only correlate with their symptoms, but also predict what their um, future uh, outcome is going to be. So the research strategies that have evolved have um, uh, developed to attack those two particular uh, things, which is one, to attack the virus, and the other strategy is to attack the inflammation. 
And, uh, and so the clinical trials that we've uh, implemented here at University Hospital uh, have uh, followed both of those strategies. We've had trials, or we have trials that are ongoing that are evaluating antiviral agents uh, that inhibit the replication of SARS-CoV-2, and we have trials that uh, are evaluating anti-inflammatory agents that dampen the overzealous inflammatory response to the virus. And the idea behind both of these strategies is to help patients uh, get better quicker, get them out of the hospital quicker, and of course, uh, preserve their life. Um, Kathleen, you've been at this for a while, you told me. Um, yeah. What's different for the, for the, for the nurse? I mean, you, you all are, are, I don't know how to describe it, kind of at the point of the spear. You're at the bedside constantly. Um, I mean, it must be, I gather it's a very different experience than, than what you're used to. Can you it, talk about that? It is a different experience, and I think the term that has been used today is surreal. It's, and it, it's witnessing suffering in new and unexpected ways. When a patient comes to the ICU, they're separated from their family. They depend upon their family for emotional and physical support. And because of COVID, that support is completely removed. As a nurse, or well, actually as a family, if you wanted to see your, your patient, uh, you, I, the nurse, bring a iPad into the room, and I hold the iPad up in front of this sick, sedated, intubated patient, and that's as good as it gets for the, for the family to be able to see the patient. And that, that's what's most painful and difficult and different as a nurse. Um, I remember this one gentleman early on. He was hard of hearing and confused, and he didn't understand what the point was of intubating him. We, he, he truly thought that we were trying to kill him. And I asked the team to just pause and stop for just a moment so we could try to help him understand that we were there to help him and not harm him. And all the while, his wife was on the phone, on speakerphone, but she was unable to help. And I think that's what's, what's most different. Um, but it, all the same, as nurses and as providers, we continue to provide all the care and support and everything else that these patients deserve and that we can give to them, knowing that their situation is, is different. Thank you very much. Uh, Rich, you said that um, you treat, when a patient presents to the emergency room today, you treat them very differently than you did six weeks ago. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a very different experience for staff to think about going to work and whether they're going to be exposed to something that may kill them. Um, that is not something that is normal for us. Um, it is not normal to think about every single patient as being a danger to themselves, to you, and to other people. So there's almost a pause uh, before you walk into the room. And it's, it's just different to look at a patient, look them in the eyes, smile, and know that they can't actually see you smile because you're wearing a mask. You can't see them smile because they're wearing a mask. If they're there because it's COVID-related or they think it's COVID-related, their first assumption is that they are going to die. Mm -hmm. And they want something. They want a test, which we may or may not have. They want a treatment that does not exist. They want to be reassured that they don't have this disease, which very often um, we, we can't do. So it's a completely different experience. What we can tell people uh, is that they're very, very unlikely to die and that the overwhelming vast majority of people do absolutely fine, and that when we send you home, if we send you home uh, with the testing that we've done, maybe even with oxygen, maybe even with a remote monitor where we can watch you from, from our virtual health center, um, you're going to be fine. Um, and it's just a level of fear on the patient's side that did not exist before. When you came in with a stomach ache, people didn't think they were going to die, they just had a stomach ache. Even when you had a heart attack, you knew that you weren't going to die, um, even though you were having a heart attack. Now everybody believes that they have a fatal illness mm -hmm. uh, when it's just not the case. So it's an entirely different approach, um, both emotionally, physically, um, how you walk in a room, how you walk out of a room, 
uh, the attention, meticulous attention to detail about what you're wearing, how you put it on, and how you take it off, um, how you instruct a patient. It's just everything is different. It's surreal is the word that keeps coming up over mm-hmm. and over again. Uh, but um, it is now different than it was eight weeks ago because we learn from each other and we literally change how we take care of these patients minute to minute. Um, and now it's incredibly safe to come to an emergency department. And what's also surreal is seeing patients who have waited days and sometimes more than days to come to an emergency department for something they automatically would have come to, mm-hmm. for, like chest pain um, or shortness of breath or stomach ache or a headache. Uh, and we're seeing uh, very late consequences of very treatable diseases that are no longer mm-hmm. treatable because people are afraid to come. And what I would love to reassure everybody is that it is safe to come. Um, you also have a, are you trained in, of all things, mass casualty preparedness? So, um, I mean, I, none of us know whether there's going to be a, a next wave. If there is one, whether it's going to be bigger than the one that we, that we said. We, we never really got to, you said we had surge plan one, two, three, and four. We mm. never got to four, did we? Uh, Thank goodness, no. Um, so let's say this next time, God forbid, we, we get to surge plan three or surge plan. Are we ready for it? So it depends what you're asking we're ready for. Right. Um, mm-hmm. We were unequivocally prepared for what came to us. Um, there has been um, ingenuity and innovation around things like PPE and supplies um, and how to take care of these patients that had never existed before. Uh, science <laughs> has never moved at the pace that science is moving now. So I look at my job and I think I just need to help people so that Tom can find the cure. Um, that's really what we're waiting for. Uh, so we need a lot of pressure, of- Tom. Really, uh. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, it's sort of the trifecta of how to fight this. It's lots of testing, whatever that may be, and we can talk about that if you like. It's some type of therapeutic, um, some type of drug, and then some type of immunity, whether it's immunity from having had it um, or it's a vaccination. Those three things, that, that what we need, that's what we need. What keeps me up at night um, and I don't sleep very well to begin with in the last eight weeks, I haven't slept at all, um, is are we paying attention and are we able to make decisions rationally so that we know that the, the tools in our toolbox are being separate because it's a contagious disease. So the farther you are away from someone, the less chance that it can be spread. Washing your hands and not touching your face, maybe wearing a mask. But we can't be isolated and on lockdown forever, so that means we have to be rational about what our next steps are. But we also have to be rational about how we react to what we see. So we should begin to try and approach normalcy. So what scares me is, are we going to react to what happens next? If we see an outbreak in a certain town or county, can we react to it, or are we gonna simply not react? So from a mass casualty care and a disaster perspective, it's preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. Um, Can we mitigate and can we respond because we've been at this so long and because there's new information coming? You mentioned testing. Uh, Do you think that we're we're getting closer to a point where we're going to have adequate testing facilities? And are the tests good enough, really? I mean, one Mm -hmm. of the problems with the existing test on the disease state, the RNA test, is that if you're not symptomatic, it's a crapshoot as to whether or not the, the test actually will tell you that you've got the, the, the disease. Is that right? Yeah. So there's three categories of testing when we talk about testing. There's the RNA test that you, that you mentioned, which is um, a big, giant-looking Q-tip that goes into the back of your nose, um, mucus, and see if that virus, the RNA virus, is in that, that mucus. Uh, there's antibody testing. That's blood tests to see if you've made antibodies, if you've been exposed, and then yet to come, not developed yet, is antigen testing. Um, And that's measuring a protein that's on the virus, the coronavirus, those little horns, that protein probably. And that can be a rapid, low-cost test. So the testing that's available, both the RNA testing and the antibody testing, is useful from an epidemiologic perspective. Can we measure large populations? On an individual perspective, it's not particularly useful because... um, As the chancellor mentioned, if you are not symptomatic, it's a 50-50 chance on whether the test is sufficiently sensitive. On the antibody uh, test, 
it's been a bit of a free-for-all, and of the 80 plus tests available, there are probably six that are accurate, which means that if you have an antibody test and it's not accurate, there's a higher chance that it's measuring antibodies to some other coronavirus than this particular coronavirus. But to answer your question, yes. Um, the United States, Colorado, uh, CU, and the Anschutz Medical Campus, it's almost been um, an exponential growth curve on testing capability, and we will have uh, sufficient testing as long as people maintain social distancing, we can prevent as much as possible mm -hmm. contagion, and we have time, time to develop testing, time for Tom to find the cure, uh, and time to see if we can have a vaccination or, or immunity. Gene, you mm -hmm. mentioned that, uh, as did Rich, that we're treating people differently now than we were mm -hmm. when, when, the, when the thing first started. Can you talk about that? I mean, one of the things I've noticed is that the number of people who don't, who get admitted, but don't actually end up in the ICU has actually grown far faster than, than the, the people who go to the ICU. Mm -hmm. what's, what's behind that? I think that in terms of how we treat people differently, we, if somebody's coming into the hospital and there's a concern about COVID, first we, fig, we find out, we wait for the testing that, yeah. that Rich mentioned to find out do they have COVID and, or do they not. And if, if they do have COVID, we have specific COVID units in the hospital. And this gets back at, at some of what Rich was saying as well, that, that we're keeping you know, the hospital clean and safe for also for the people who don't have COVID so we can care for you. And I, I think what we're seeing is we have those patients who come in and they may be in the hospital for three, four, five days, and then they get better and they go home. They never need an ICU. About a third of our patients that are admitted do need an ICU. And of those, we seem to see also kind of two separate groups. There's the, the groups that um, have kind of a relatively, it's long for an ICU stay, but still relatively short in terms of what we're seeing for COVID, that they're maybe in the ICU for a week, eight days. But then we're also seeing a group that have really prolonged ICU stays, prolonged time on the ventilator, three weeks, four weeks, and they have a, then a prolonged hospital stay as well. So what we're seeing is we have a number of patients that not only are they you know, sick from having had COVID and that recovery, but anybody who is that long on a ventilator, that long in an ICU, that critically ill, have a long road back to recovery. So we are seeing our kind of hospital, like what we call floor level patient population, growing faster than our ICU population. And you say the outcomes are improving. Outcomes are, are definitely improving. And we're, we're seeing here, I think, through this great teamwork and, and, and uh, innovation and um, really staying on top of the evidence and generating the evidence, we're actually seeing that our outcomes so far are looking better than what we've seen in other states or, or internationally. That's good. Um, Tom, uh, we, we said the pressure's on you. <laughs> uh, what do you see coming down the road in terms of new therapies? I mean, I, are you hopeful that, that we will, in pick a period of time, six months, come up with, with uh, therapies that actually mitigate the, the worst parts of this disease? Yes, uh, I'm uh, very help, uh, hopeful of that. In, in fact, uh, last week uh, was a, a week of big news for um, uh, COVID-19 uh, treatment. Um, on Wednesday of, uh, of last week, there were uh, two press releases uh, concerning an antiviral drug. So this is part of the strategy to attack the virus directly. Uh, an antiviral drug called remdesivir. And um, uh, what these uh, uh, press releases announced was that um, there are some preliminary data that um, remdesivir can help people uh, get better faster, and it may also uh, actually lower uh, mortality rate. We haven't um, actually seen those data yet. Um, they haven't been published, uh, but I expect that that will be coming uh, soon. So I think the, the big news there is that now just uh, a little over four months into this uh, epidemic, uh, we have a, a medicine that appears to have some effect on slowing down the disease and helping people get better faster. Um, it may not be the best medicine uh, by the time this is all over. And so there will be uh, a lot of uh, uh, future research that's still necessary to find better medicines, 
to find medicines that can be used together with remdesivir um, to, uh, uh, to uh, help, um, uh, help get people better faster. And uh, there's a lot of work uh, going on with uh, evaluating uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, there's another antiviral drug called hydroxychloroquine uh, that's still in clinical trials. Uh, and there are what are called monoclonal antibodies being developed against the viral spike protein that will hopefully be going into clinical trials in the coming month. So, so I think there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, of hope for even better treatment uh, than what we have now. Remdesivir uh, stole the headlines last week. You're running a clinical trial that, that puts patients onto remdesivir, I believe. Um, can you get remdesivir if you, if you want it? So um, as part of the announcement uh, last, uh, last week, on Friday, um, the Food and Drug Administration issued an emergency use authorization uh, that allows for more general usage of, uh, of remdesivir. And that is uh, still in the process of being sorted out as to how uh, remdesivir is going to be distributed um, uh, through that emergency use authorization. Uh, right now, here at University of Colorado Hospital, uh, we have two clinical trials of remdesivir. And so patients who qualify for those clinical trials can access uh, remdesivir in, in that way. Uh, we haven't yet uh, uh, gotten uh, access to the emergency use authorization remdesivir. Hopefully that will be coming in the future. Great. Kathleen, how, how are you and your colleagues holding up? I mean, what's, <laughs> what is morale like? We're doing okay. Uh, emotions have been running high since this all began. And younger nurses look to veterans like me and my, my older peers uh, for guidance. And I say to them, look, we will continue to do the best work that we can because that's what we do. We're ICU nurses at University of Colorado Hospital. And what we have to help our patients will change. And it may decrease. We may have increase in supplies. It, it, but we will continue to do our very best work, no matter the circumstances, because that's the right thing to do. But to just give a, a little plug out to the, uh, to the local leadership the, uh, in the ICUs, the, the unit managers and unit nurse man, uh, associate nurse managers, they have been working tirelessly, early mornings, late evenings, right next to us. They're, they're there, they're physically present, and I think their physical presence helps to boost morale among all my peers because they see and understand exactly the struggles that we have taking care of these COVID patients. And I guess it doesn't get any easier over time, does it? No. Sadly, no. It, it almost feels like Groundhog's Day <laughs> every day. It's the same, same situation, but we're becoming experts, I'd say. <laughs> We've got this. Um, are, are providers, and this could be for any of you, getting the mental health support that, that people need? If, if I mean, it, this has to put people into various stages of crisis at various points. Get caregivers, I mean, not, not just the patients. Yeah. Is the mental health support there for, for you when you need it? Yeah, it's a great question, Don, and, and, and I would give a, a big shout out to our Department of Psychiatry. Our, our department chair, uh, Neil Epperson, jumped on this right away and uh, very rapidly put together a whole package of support for all of our providers, all of our staff, whether it's individual counseling, whether it's group sessions, uh, other resources. Uh, we've had people rounding in the units to check in and see how people are doing. So I would say the resources are definitely there, although we have seen that uh, I think also people are so busy and so in the moment that they, the uptake of them has not been as much as we would have thought they would have been, but they are there. And I do think there's a lot of, of support just within the services themselves. I know Rich has done a lot of work with his, in his department chair role of making sure that his providers on the front line know that, that they're appreciated, we understand what, what they're going through, and here are the resources for them. I think that some of the things we worry about is actually the, the sort of, as this goes on and, and on, is how people do over time, and recognizing that when maybe we're not quite as busy with COVID, hopefully, 
that may be actually when people need the resources, they may be so in it right now that actually going there yeah. and sort of crossing that threshold, and I'd like to hear from yeah. you too. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah that people may be doing a little self-protection right now and they may actually need the support three months, six months down the line. Um, yeah, I, I would 100% agree with that. I think right now we're so focused mentally on caring for the patients and by keeping that, that barrier between our, our emotions and, and what we're doing is necessary. But as, as hopefully the, the numbers go down, we will need that. And it's, it, is, it is there, we know it's there. And, and also we, we have a lot of, of support from our chaplain services. Mm -hmm. They really have stepped up not just to help with the patients and communicating for the families, um, bridging that gap, but they're there for us as well, and, and we feel it. So, yeah, one of these days we will be taking up that mental health services that are offered. I hope, I, I, I promise you we'll make sure we, we have it ready when, when you need it. Thank you. Um, so the 64,000, you, you said this is likely to go on for a long time. Rich talked about the trifecta, the, the, probably the, the biggest home run in that trifecta is actually a vaccine, right? How, how do any of you feel about the prospects of a, of, uh, of a, of a vaccine and, and what the timing of that might look like? I mean, you're, we, re, we read the press about it all the time, and various opinions have been floated uh, by different people who may or may not be uh, <laughs> scientists. Um, and, and yet, you know, the, what I'm hearing is maybe not in at least at scale until sometime next year. Is that a, is that a, a an opinion you all share? I would say, because remember there's two steps. There's one, creating an effective vaccine and we want it to be safe and effective. And then there's the distribution chain of it and making sure that it gets out to people as well. So I don't think before next year, Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think um, it's, it's really hard to say for sure because we don't have enough information you know, certainly um, some viruses, it was very easy to just even stumble across a, a vaccine that worked, uh, worked well. Uh, you know, polio is an example of a, of a viral disease where a vaccine can be very effective. Whereas other viral infections like uh, uh, HIV, uh, we've been trying for almost 30 years to develop a vaccine and have yet to be uh, successful. So it's, it's hard to say how... Um, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is going to fall out within that uh, uh, spectrum of, uh, of viral illnesses. Uh, we need to understand uh, better about, uh, more about the antibody response that uh, Rich mentioned. Uh, we know that people make antibodies to the virus as they recover from infection, but we don't know uh, which, if any of those antibodies, are protective against subsequent infections. Not all antibodies are protective antibodies, and so we need to understand more uh, about that. And then uh, as vaccines are developed, it's important uh, to, to understand both their safety uh, and their efficacy before they're made widely available. And particularly the uh, safety part of it is, uh, is very important uh, because uh, if we didn't have a safe vaccine, uh, then it could potentially do more harm than good. But I, I'm optimistic uh, by nature. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, we will uh, develop a, a vaccine, and uh, it may not be six months, but I, I would uh, predict within a, a year or so. Right. I think it's also important um, when you talk about vaccines that vaccines are only part of the immunity spectrum because there's a requirement for herd immunity. So it's not just one person in a group of 10 uh, getting vaccinated. It's many people or a large proportion of people mm -hmm in a population getting vaccinated and getting immunity because then there's herd immunity. And I think everybody has seen what happens when uh, there's a decrease in vaccinations. There's an outbreak of the disease, but also an outbreak of the disease among people who have been vaccinated. So it really requires an entire societal approach to immunity. Okay, some questions from, from the audience. Um, what is CU doing to share expertise with hospitals throughout the region to ensure high levels of care across the region? I can, I can start with that. Uh, it, it's actually been a, a terrific uh, collaboration. I mentioned the collaboration within CU, but it, it, across the region, uh, both across all of our UC Health hospitals, uh, which you know, we have 12 hospitals total, 
as well as across to other hospitals in the region and also nationally, there's been such a rapid sharing of information. So for example, across critical care uh, groups, actually across the whole state, we have a, a site uh, that our critical care docs actually started that has access, that we've uh, opened up for access for critical care docs across the state that shares algorithms, shares the latest evidence. We also on our UC Health uh, uh, public provider website have also shared any updates that we have around some of those uh, algorithms and all. And then we actually have uh, across the state have regular calls by the chief medical officers across all of the, the health systems to make sure that we're learning from each other. So it's really been this is like, I have a running list of things that would be great if we could continue even, uh, even when we're out of crisis. And I think the level of collaboration among the healthcare community uh, and the level of, of being willing to share and learn from each other is high on my list. So you mentioned algorithms. Are we any better now at being able to predict when somebody gets admitted uh, what their level of severity is like? I mean, what, who's going to do better and who's not going to do quite as well? Is there, is, are we learning how to do that yet? Or is that, is that something that's still down the road? I would say there's some of that, and I think we're going to get better as we do some of the monitoring uh, through, through our virtual health center that Rich talked about. And some of that is uh, what we have gotten better about is if somebody is showing some, some signs of declining clinically, because that's one of the hallmarks of COVID is that when people start to decline, they decline quickly and they need rapid action. And we definitely have uh, gotten systems into place where we are acting sooner and in some cases then preventing people from getting intubated because we're acting sooner. But I do think some of the, the virtual health center um, surveillance is going to help with that. Would you agree? Yeah, we, we've had some very interesting successes uh, because of um, how pressing this is. And we've been able to discharge patients home uh, on monitors, you know, a mm -hmm. monitor that measures their oxygen level or their heart rate and we monitor them uh, remotely. And we've been able to recognize when a patient has been getting more ill before they recognize that they're getting ill. And we've been able to bring them back to the hospital or triangulate oxygen to them. Uh, so it's, we've been able to progress very quickly from that perspective. We also have developed learning algorithms that are embedded in our electronic medical record uh, that have had wide distribution since this started so that a clinician can click on a button and whatever the latest is, and sometimes it's updated three, four times a day, um, is what you're supposed to do. And we've shared that learning knowledge with mm -hmm. anybody in the country. Here's, oops. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And uh, I, I might add also that one of the uh, great um, things that our electronic medical record has enabled us to do is to learn uh, about things as we uh, go along. And there, uh, there's a group of researchers uh, uh, in our um, ICU uh, department who have uh, uh, figured out that there is an inflammatory marker that can be measured soon after a patient is admitted that is, seems to be a pretty good predictor of whether that uh, patient will require mechanical ventilation. Here's one of my favorites. Are temperatures being taken to enter stores, businesses, actually a helpful tool? Anybody <laughs> want to comment on that? <laughs> so, so uh, I can uh, give some personal experience with that. Uh, just in, uh, in terms of one of our research units uh, here uh, on, the, on campus that has remained open uh, during the, uh, the COVID outbreak in order to provide access to research for patients with um, uh, other non-COVID diseases that still uh, need to be part of clinical research, either to be monitored or to get uh, clinical treatment. And uh, we... Uh, instituted at the beginning of the outbreak a procedure for both patients and staff entering that facility uh, where they would uh, complete a questionnaire and have a temperature uh, check uh, in, in order to keep people out who might have uh, uh, COVID without knowing it. And uh, after doing that for some several hundred uh, um, visits to that facility, we've not identified one fever. So. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a proponent of, uh, of just random temperature monitoring. And the patients that we do see who we know have COVID, um, a third of them don't have a fever at all. Okay. Um, how many COVID patients currently are currently at University of Colorado Hospital, and what, how does that relate to the highest number that we've seen? 
Right. Uh, so I, I, maybe I'll give an overall picture sure. too. If, if you look um, across UC Health, uh, UC Health itself has taken care of about 35% of the patients in Colorado that have been hospitalized with COVID. And here at University of Colorado Hospital, we've taken care of about 20% of those in the state that have been hospitalized. Uh, we saw a high, I believe at University of Colorado Hospital, in the high 150s of number of patients hospitalized with COVID. We have seen, and you know, we're all sort of cautiously holding our breath here. Uh, we've seen that number go down uh, day over day. Uh, I think today we still have 130, 120 um, hospitalized mm -hmm. at University of Colorado Hospital. So it's still out there. <laughs> Are there common factors, uh, this asks among younger people, but I would say among an, anybody, uh, people getting COVID, like smoking or vaping? I mean, do, do we, have we been able to identify whether, whether uh, those habits, which are obviously not particularly good for your lungs, uh, complicate the matter of, of, of coming down with COVID? So certainly uh, comorbidities have a lot to do with how severe your illness is. And uh, what we've really noticed especially from the patients who are coming in precipitously, is that there's a common theme of obesity, a uh, common theme of uh, often some type of kidney impairment, heart disease, lung disease, or diabetes, um, and then some other state that uh, compromises your immune system. So having more than one of those is, is bad, um, and having none of them is, is better. Uh, but the combination of, of them can be particularly bad, including uh, lung disease. Um, Tom, you mentioned hydroxychloroquine, um, which was also in the news quite a bit a while ago. Um, I seem to remember reading that, that there are some side effects to that drug that are pretty severe for certain people. But are we, we are currently testing that in the clinical trial? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, so that's a, a very good point there. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is a uh, medicine that uh, has been in, in uh, use uh, since the 1950s. Uh, it's a medicine that's used to treat uh, malaria. Um, it's also a medicine that, in addition to have, having anti-infective properties, also has anti-inflammatory properties, and it's used to treat rheumatoid arthritis uh, and lupus and other inflammatory diseases. But it does have potential serious uh, side effects, particularly for people who may have a history of heart disease uh, and people who may be taking other medicines that affect the heart. So it's not something that should be uh, used lightly and, uh, or, or casually. And uh, it is something, though, that needs to be evaluated uh, in uh, uh, well-designed, uh, well-controlled clinical trials to see if it provides benefit uh, for people with COVID-19. There were some early studies that suggested that it did, but that certainly has not been proven. Uh, and uh, we have an uh, ongoing study here uh, at University of Colorado Hospital evaluating um, uh, hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients. And we will also have a couple studies coming very soon to evaluate it in the outpatient setting uh, with the idea that it might be able to help prevent people from having to be hospitalized uh, with COVID-19. Okay, here's one. Is, are the governor and the mayor working with CU on state and city policies? I mean, the answer to that is that uh, all, almost all of the modeling work that's been done to predict the trajectory of the, of the pandemic in Colorado has actually been done uh, in partnership with the Colorado School of Public Health, which is part of the University of Colorado here at the Anschutz campus. So we have been uh, actively involved on a literally daily, hourly, minutely basis with the state in trying to uh, help understand um, what policies need to be created to keep that curve, uh, uh, the, the, to flatten the curve is the, the expression that everybody uses. So it's, it's been a, a, a major effort on the part of the School of Public Health and in fact on some of the faculty from the School of Medicine. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it is something that we've been doing. I'm gonna end with one that uh, is a, another uh, favorite from, from uh, from anybody really uh, uh, that's living the way we're living today, is social is social distancing, or I think we're supposed to politically correct, be correct now and call it physical distancing. Is that the answer forever? And how will increased testing impact the situation? 
It's the only tool in our toolbox right now. Uh, it may not be for forever, um, but the way that testing may uh, change that is if we have different testing, more testing, accurate testing, um, we can broadly test and then isolate where a pocket of this infection may be uh, combined with some type of contact tracing, which means following who you've touched and how you've been near. So for the immediate future, and that immediate future could be months to a couple of years, uh, it is going to be with us and should be with us, and um, it's the only thing we really have. Uh, but eventually, uh, we will have the right type of testing, the right type of immunity, and the right type of treatment uh, where that will be able to change, hopefully. So I want to thank my colleagues for being here with us today, and most of all, I want to thank you uh, for all the support that you've given us. Uh, we, we couldn't do this without your support, and, and it means a lot. So we hope that we've provided some information that was some value to you, uh, and we hope you have a, a good day, and the rest of your day is a good day. And please stay safe and take care of yourselves. Thanks very much.